Um, thank you, and I'm hoping to move then to the second panel very quickly. I'd just like to mention that the other host of this event is the UN Foundation, which sees its role as showcasing how the United Nations, and in this case, the UN Environmental Program, is developing information, solution-based ideas, and translating environmental monitoring and assessment into possible policy pathways as we chart the future. Mary Robinson said just this week in New York that 2015 brought us a transformative agenda. Paris Climate Agreement and Sustainable Development Goals. We, those of us working on the Global Environmental Outlook, and I say this as a civil society member of the high-level group, hope that the Global Environmental Outlook will be one of the tools that gives us solutions for this transformative world we have to create. So to begin our panel, I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have, and I'm going to skip long bios because we've provided them to you. Terry Keating of EPA, who worked on air and air quality air pollution issues. Sumi Mehta from the UN Foundation's Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves. Sumi has been looking at indoor air quality and also the links between indoor and outdoor air quality and the impact on human health. And Paula Brandt, our colleague from Environment Canada, who will have a number of comments to make. I think what you can see from the panel is the North America assessment is rich in information, data, technology, and application of technology to environmental assessment, monitoring, and data collection. This is not universally the case globally, but if we get geo right and move toward a more integrative, open source data platform, we will be able to build data capacity globally for more active and real-time environmental assessment. So I'd like to start with Terry. Great. Thank you very much, Melinda. And so I, I'm one of the, the coordinating lead authors. Um, and so my presentation is sort of a continuation of the, the last panel. And I, I really appreciate um, the organizers and my colleagues for um, accommodating my schedule. I, I wasn't able to join you right at two, so I slipped in the back um, in the middle of the last panel. And so I'm going to repeat a lot some of the same themes that you heard that actually appear throughout the report. Um, that, but specifically from, from an air quality perspective, because it turns out that air, air, you see some of these same issues come up specifically in the area of, of air quality. And so first I'd like to acknowledge the, the other coordinating lead author, my partner in crime, Phil Dickerson from the US EPA, who, who's um, down in our North Carolina offices. And so that the story from an air quality standpoint in North America is really quite a good news story and, and we really hope has an influence on air quality efforts in, in the rest of the world. Um, it, the, um, in the US we have a very, and Canada, um, we have a very effective air quality management system um, that continues to 
decrease emissions, improve air quality, and bring quite significant public health benefits um, to our economies as our economies continue to, to grow and, and, and prosper. We, we think that the, the systems that we've put in place, the tools that we've developed, the progress that we've made can really be examples to the rest of the world where in, in at least in other places of the world where air pollution continues to grow. Um, despite the progress here at home, uh, there's still work to be done. There's still about 140 million people in North America that live in areas that we would consider have to have unhealthful air quality. And we need to bring air quality, uh, clean air to everyone in, in North America. And one of the, the really emerging drivers of clean air in North America and really around the world is this provision of, of public information and, and and particularly the the development of sensor technology and information management technology that's allowing people to gain access to information about emissions, their exposure, um, it, air quality in almost near real time. And that op opens up a variety of opportunities both for mitigating exposures, but for management a, as well and, and better understanding. And it helps to build a public demand um, for clean air. So a lot of the, the data that's in the report, I'm not sure where this goes and if I do it again. No, nope, it's saying ding. The other direction, there we go, okay. Um, a lot of the, the figures and data in the report are from um, both US EPA and Environment Canada official reports. This is a figure that we use a lot at the US EPA. It shows the trends in economic drivers and emissions from the period from 1970. The first couple of data points are decadal, 70, 80, 90. And then starting in 95 where that dashed line is, you see the annual trends in GDP, vehicle miles traveled, population, energy consumption, all going up. But the bottom line is aggregate emissions of, of the six most common um, air pollutants going down. And, and so we like to point to this to say, you can actually have economic growth and environmental improvement at the same time. And we point to this a lot. A, um, a selfish um, uh, sort of plug here, which you might not be able to see in the back, but the update to this figure was just released this morning. And so um, along with a whole bunch of other information about air quality trends um, in, in the US and in a very nice um, web format um, that's interactive and it's available at this um, URL. And the easiest way to get to it is www.epa.gov slash air trends. And so um, in the US, um, and and um, in um, it, it, in really in North America, but this is specifically referring to a U.S. policy. Uh, we've really, in the last ten years, really seen some amazing progress um, with respect to uh, emissions of of nitrogen oxides, and and I wanted to to highlight that um, as as one of the big success stories that we've seen recently. And, and here what you're seeing is uh, actual observations from a satellite, from a NASA satellite, looking down at nitrogen dioxide at the column through the atmosphere. And these are the annual averages in, the, in each of these locations, and you're looking at the difference between 2005 and 2011. And what you see is the, the impact of power plant controls that have been applied in the eastern U.S. primarily. And so... And these, the, these emissions contribute to both ozone and fine particle formation, which are the, the major components of, of re both regional and urban smog. Um, I think Mark might have shown th this figure earlier. A little bit longer success story throughout North America has been um, the uh, programs to address sulfur pollution from, uh, from power plants. Um, this shows the trend in sulfate deposition. So these are monitors that are, are on the ground spread out um, uh, throughout the, the eastern North America into, into the western US and then you show dots for, for some of the locations in, the, um, in western Canada, um, which it's harder to, to, 
to draw the surfaces, so we just represent them as, as dots um, between them. Um, but you see the tremendous um, progress between 1990 and, and 2012, uh, and, and this is really the, the progress of the acid rain um, uh, programs, uh, both within the U.S. And, and within Canada, and the cooperation between the two countries, um, which is, is, is somewhat unique. Uh, in, the, in the report, we note and discuss a couple of, of, of trends that are driving uh, air, qu that air quality and continue to be issues. Um, one is, is continued urbanization and the growth of cities, which is moving um, the location of emissions, spreading things out. Um, it, that's really changing some of the, the way air pollution is formed and, and um, people are exposed. Um, oil and gas development in both the Intermountain West in the U.S. and, and in Alberta and the tar sands, um, these are all uh, changing, adding air pollution sources in places that never had them before, uh, and the amount of development is, is really quite remarkable. Uh, and, and the availability of real-time data and small sensors, each of these things are, are sort of driving changes now in our focus within air quality management. There are still a, a number of challenges uh, that, that we have uh, f to, to face and that air quality management within the two um, countries is going to have to evolve to address. Um, some of those are, one, ad adapting to global change, both in terms of climate change uh, and as well as emission changes in the rest of the world. Both of those will, especially over the next 20 to 30 years, are going to make our job of reaching our own um, air quality goals in the U.S. and Canada more difficult. Um, the integrated management of pollutants. So for a long time, uh, we've always approached things from a uh, single pollutant by pollutant basis. We develop a plan for how we're going to deal with ozone, how we're going to deal with fine particles, how we're going to deal with carbon monoxide. And and we need to start looking at that, and we've struggled with this issue for some time, of how do we look at those in a more integrated fashion? How do we look at the air pollutants at the same time as we're looking at greenhouse gas emissions? How do we look at air pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, and water quality and other um, pollutants, uh, uh, problems all at the same time? Um, the, we need to also, uh, uh, while we've made real progress in reducing the exposures of the general population, there's still um, subpopulations uh, which are, uh, are, are affected uh, uh, disproportionately and, um, and particularly with sensitive, vulnerable, and, and disadvantaged populations that we need to, to work to reduce their exposures. Um, we're, it, while we've made a lot of progress on the public health side, um, there's still a lot of work to be done um, to protect ecosystems. And, and the challenge with ecosystems is, is protecting them from the cumulative impacts of, of, of multiple sources of pollution and multiple stresses and, and how we do that and how we bring that into, um, into the management program. And then finally, as we've made progress, controlling the big sources like the power plants and controlling mobile sources, um, uh, cars and, 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 and trucks, then we end up with what's left to control and where can we get further reductions are much smaller sources, much more diffuse, and much bigger challenge um, for a, a, a management program or a regulatory program. And, and so those are some of the things that, that we continue to face um, into the future. Thanks. Thanks, Terry. Now I'm going to turn to Sumi Mehta and ask her to kind of put this in an individual public health context. I'm going to switch them off now. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm focusing on a topic which is probably a little bit, you might be wondering, outside of the realm of um, the other speakers today, but hopefully we can put it into um, co um, context a little bit. Um, for those of you who may not um, be familiar um, with this issue, this notion of people continuing to cook with um, cook or heat with solid fuels, and this includes things like 
wood, dung, crop residues, um, coal and charcoal. It's something that still affects around 3 billion people on a global scale. And um, I'm not going to focus too much on the health as as aspects today, but really around 4 million deaths, depending on what estimate you believe, um, attributable to exposure to household air pollution every every year. So really um, up there with the major top five um, risk factors to, glo to health on a global scale. Um, and also a major driver of, um, of, of climate impacts with around 25% of black cli carbon and other short-lived climate forces actually um, occurring as a result of household air pollution. So just to give you a little bit of a flavor for this in more detail, if you see here, this is really kind of the, the map of the population um, using solid fuels as of, as of 2010. Um, not too much of a different picture as you might see if you updated it. Um, I just want to emphasize, I mean, if you look in terms of the places that are kind of the darker shaded colors on this, um, where you still have, you know, um, more than half of the population in these countries using um, solid fuels for cooking and heating. It looks on the map like, okay, well, we've actually made uh, quite a bit of progress. And in fact, in relative terms, that's true, that the numbers are going down. But if you think about our population growth in absolute terms, in fact, there are more people exposed to household air pollution today than there have been any time in human history since we actually started, um, you know, controlling fire. So this is, uh, you know, some definitely a problem that has unfortunately not gone away with development that we still have to contend with. Um, also, as a result of, um, you know, fuel collection, um, what we've seen when um, we've really looked into detail at some of the, um, you know, more careful estimates trying to get a sense of the non-renewability of biomass fuels is that there's still um, over 275 million people, um, particularly in rural areas, who are now experiencing um, really scarcity of their subsistence, subsistence energy. So really the basic energy that they need um, in their lives um, is, is an issue in terms of their access there too. And then very quickly, um, just again to give you a little bit more background in case you're not familiar, when we talk about household air pollution, we're not really talking about one specific pollutant. We're talking about really the complex mix of pollutants that occur as a result of incomplete combustion. And as you can imagine, solid fuel use, this is really, um, it's really um, a biomass combustion. So in some ways, very similar to the other types of combustion products that you can think about, you know, whether you're thinking about um, ambient air pollution sources, whether you're thinking about tobacco, for example, which of course is also biomass combustion. It's just either you put it in your mouth or somebody around you happens to be smoking it. Um, but, but very similar, and I think that this is something that the public health community has, has become um, aware of and something that we need to think about also more broadly on the environmental side. And also to note that we now say household air pollution rather than indoor air pollution because we realize that most of the smoke, um, even when it does happen indoors, and of course in many places people actually cook outdoors, um, this really results in a lot of um, ambient air pollution. You can see here in the same household um, how much of the smoke is actually getting outdoors. And in fact, as you can see here, household air pollution um, is really a major source of ambient or outdoor air pollution, particularly in India and China. Um, up to a third of ambient air pollution in, in, the, in the winter, se in the cold season, for example. Um, but even on a, a global scale, it's around 12% of the global PM2.5 uh, um, emissions, so around 4 micrograms per meter cubed, is really um, occurring as a result of household air pollution. Um, and I wanted to note, particularly within our region here in North America, um, as Terry's mentioned, so much progress has been made with other sources, but residential wood smoke is still a major um, source of pollution that we still have to contend with in North America as well as in Europe. And so if we really want to think about um, being able to meet the air quality uh, standards, um, this is something that really has to continue to be um, kind of focused on. And, and I think it's also useful in, in terms of the actual um, uh, the GEO6 report to think about, you know, a lot of the discussions that we've had today about um, really being able to increase the accessibility of data, making things available um, to be able to inform decisions, increase awareness. Um, we really have in this region a wealth of data 
um, lots and lots of data on air quality. Um, this is certainly not the case everywhere else. And I think that it's one thing to talk about accessibility of data, but in this case, I think we also have to think about what are going to be the priorities in terms of filling in the data gaps. And indeed, I think there are lots of expertise um, you know, within the North American region that we can really harness to kind of expand um, you know, our knowledge elsewhere. And, and just in terms of a little bit more on the health impact side of things here, you can actually see that air pollution was responsible for around 10 percent of all deaths on a global scale um, in, in the latest kind of 2013 estimate. Um, and this is certainly the case in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, but also very much the case actually in North America. And you can see here, you know, this is both a, a mix of the different sources um, that are mentioned here in, in the bottom left, but really um, th there's the household piece as well as the household to ambient piece um, that one has to consider. The other thing to note, I think, um, getting back to this theme of kind of local versus regional here, is that the climate impacts of household air pollution are really both local and regional, and actually quite surprisingly so if you actually start to look at it in detail. So if you look at this top figure here, um, this is giving you kind of the average radiative forcing emissions for East Africa um, when you're looking at kind of the black carbon emissions um, reductions that are th that are possible here. And you can see the range of technologies across the bottom. I'll just read them out because it may be um, hard to hear. Um, the, the first is off-road diesel. Then you've got on-road diesel. Um, then you've got the LPG biogas cook stoves, um, briquettes or coal stoves, pellet wood stoves, oil and gas flare reduction, um, fires, and then um, global fires, and then Eurasian fires. And you can see on the top here that in East Africa, as you might imagine, um, really being able to shift to, um, to kind of the, the really clean fuels for your cook stoves will give you a real, really a big impact on a, um, for that region. Now, I think what's a little bit counterintuitive or maybe surprising for at least was quite surprising for me is that if you look at the same um, so the same mix of things, but you look for the um, for the Himalayan regions, for example, you see very much the same pattern here happening. So um, you know it's 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 really consistent across a range of different areas. Um, and in fact, um, if you think then about how the potential to really reduce um, warming from black carbon and other short-lived climate forces. Um, and if you look here, um, these are now across all of um, a, a range of different regions. So we have Africa on the left, Latin America, Caribbean, North America, Europe, um, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. And then the last one is Southwest and Central Asia. And again, I apologize that it's difficult to see the, the different mm -hmm. regions here. Um, but if you can hopefully see the colors on the different columns, um, this is really how much of the short-lived climate forces you could actually reduce um, by, by focusing on different interventions. Um, the ones that are here in red really represent the ones that are kind of cooking related. Um, so the, the, green, um, the green one is really the switch from kind of the traditional biomass cook stoves, again, to LPG or biogas. Um, and then the red here, and this gets back at the wood smoke issue, the red is really replacing current residential wood burning technologies with be better pellet stoves. And so you can see here in the middle graph um, that really there is a large contribution that we could make within this region by really focusing on the residential wood stoves issue. And then the final, the final bits, I think, in terms of the blue for looking at kind of focusing on coal reduction as well. Um, but so this is really something that I think is, you know, maybe more prevalent in other places, but certainly has a lot of relevance here. And I think that there's certainly a lot of things, as I mentioned, that we can do here for other places as well. So just, just to wrap up, I mean, I think there were also um, quite a few of us are now thinking in terms of this new um, SDG lens. Mm -hmm. And it's really important, I think, to consider how, as we're doing our work in our separate areas, um, you know, how are we really working across the different SDG goals? And so just to give you a flavor, um, you know, for the example of clean cooking, um, this is really integral to achieving many of the global goals. And I've just tried to highlight here um, in yellow some of the ones that are really specifically focused on the environment climate side of things. 
um, both in terms of, of, of looking at zero hunger, um, because there are also a lot of impacts on agricultural productivity that have been seen, for example, um, looking again on the um, impacts on public health, um, looking at, um, you know, particularly in, um, in, in energy security aspects and thinking about proper access to energy um, within the cities and the urban context, really thinking about um, clean cooking there. Um, and then, of course, the climate and um, environmental sustainability, I think we've mentioned already. Thank you. So I... I just like to underscore what is really critical to, critical to understand is every single regional assessment looked at growing air quality problems except for North America and many of these air quality problems could be reduced by good management of solid fuels. And that's a really critical component, not just of geo, but also sustainable development goals, public health agendas, and certainly our long-term aspiration for a better climate approach. So I'm going to turn to our two government representatives and call first on Paula Brandt, who's joined us by video over this entire session. And so, Paula, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Melinda. I uh, appreciate the introduction. And uh, it's been an interesting, an interesting discussion. And I, I think for the sake of um, the very, very, very interesting questions that the audience had in the first round, I'm going to keep my comments relatively uh, relatively brief. Um, uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about a, a few of the things we haven't been talking about in terms of what's in what's in geo and some of those uh, topics, and and focusing on this notion that was brought up a few times with folks about thinking more in an integrated manner and how that has either played out in geo or could play out in in, in the future way of, of, of looking at things. Um, for example, uh, uh, again, back to the notion that. I am on the screen, hello. Um, uh, I, I'm on a different little screen here in my office, so I don't, uh, there's this video lag between the big screens, so I don't, I don't pay attention to that one. <laughs> um, uh, what I wanted to talk about was uh, Jason, picking up on Jason's point about geo being a process. So it is a static document book, um, however, um, and, and why it is important to keep this process ongoing, when we look at the policy uh, agenda that we're in right now in Canada, we would see a very different context than um, than, what, than there was when we were drafting this document even six months ago mm -hmm. or definitely a year ago having gone through an election process. And it plays out in large part in the climate change agenda. Uh, and uh, so a lot of that stuff about the recent policy developments and the policy responses, responses that we talked about earlier, Mark talked about earlier, um, um, are, are different than they were when we started. So I think that's another uh, aspect that GEO has to, to bring to bear that to keep that kind of momentum going about what the policy responses are. So for example, on the climate change front here in Canada, a massive effort underway right now on what we're calling the Pan-Canadian Framework, um, very serious commitment by the Prime Minister and our Minister uh, and a collection of Ministers, massive investments in, in climate change that are uh, are really hoping to bear fruit and, and hope to see those impacts in future deals and, and future policy responses. Mm -hmm. What's important with those as well is the collaborative nature in which they're being undertaken, which is, I guess we call it adaptive governance, but for me it, 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 it may be a little bit different, and I think that's important to point out how, um, how much outreach is being done in terms of reaching out to individual Canadians, uh, stakeholder groups at large, our Indigenous um, peoples as well, to bring them all into this whole process. And, and, and sort of gauntlet, how does GEO capture that as a snapshot in time when, when the policy process is very evolutionary? And I think that's a, an interesting challenge, challenge for us. Um, a couple topics that we haven't really talked on, uh, talked on, but I just want to mention that, that, that there's some important work inside the inside the, the, the geo with respect to energy, uh, laying a case and, and looking at the energy profiles in the, in the two countries and where things are and whatnot. Uh, we didn't have a speaker on that, but would draw a few 
energy, energy use is a highly consumptive North American consumption behavior mm. that we all uh, are part of, um, are part of the, 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 the solution, but also um, um, heavily uh, energy dependent on, on our lifestyles. Transportation, uh, mobility, those issues are important and are, are reflected to some extent inside the, inside the geo process. Um, healthy ecosystems, we talked about land, we talked about air, uh, we talked a bit about water, but really looking at the ecosystem approach. And so um, some nod and, and very important nod given to the whole ecosystem services function that are played out by our, our ecosystems and, and um, health of wetlands and those kinds of things that are important and continue to be important as the geo process has unfolds. Uh, I think when you look at, if I just cycle back a little bit on the climate change file, if you look at where um, we're headed on things like methane, things like hydrofluoro uh, HFCs, again, policy is evolving all the time on these on these two fronts, those two in particular, and, and again, the, the process of geo to keeping that evergreen and keeping up with that and, and reflecting that. Uh, again, things that weren't happening when we wrote these books are happening now, and, and we, how do we be adapted? terms of keeping that up to date is, is, is really important. Um, I sort of mentioned earlier about opportunities, and I really think it's, it was one of the things I tried to influence in the, in the document was to really begin to frame things not always as problems, but opportunities to move forward. And the one that I like to cite is, while the GEO report we may talk about our crumbling infrastructure, uh, for example, that is under, I think a lot of people, the, the report talks about that. Um, uh, talks about the state of it. It's an area where there will be massive investments in the future, um, uh, and there are in our budget announcements uh, large sums of money uh, dedicated towards new infrastructure for our country. And how do we get the best investment out of those from a green infrastructure point of view? So that integrating environmental considerations into decision making and, and trying to influence that is really critical to in order to in order to move forward and i think that's a really important piece that the geo can continue has, has identified but can continue to continue to monitor and look at that picking up and staying with the theme of integration i i i um, and sh i will share with you the enthusiasm that our new minister has around this notion of integration and and um uh, for those of you who don't follow um, Minister Catherine McKenna on Twitter, you should because she's, she's very, <laughs> very, very active on it. And uh, she's always got a lot to say on a lot, a lot of topics, uh, which is a whole new sphere for politicians to, to play in. But mm. I'm thinking aloud of how do investments that we make in social housing ensure that they have climate change benefits? How do we make sure that climate change policies are at a minimum gender neutral, but don't continue to disadvantage perhaps certain genders and or certain populations? Mm -hmm. So the social dimension of those things are critical that we have to think these through and be very mindful of that. Um, one thing that's incredibly important is how we engage with our indigenous populations, our indigenous people, how we respect their traditional knowledge and how we use that as part of every bit the quality scientific knowledge that we have in these types of reports because they have tremendous information there and tremendously are impacted tremendously by developments on their lands and on their on their lifestyles. And those things need to be respected and, and put in place mm -hmm. inside of these frameworks that we're talking about. And I guess the last one that I want to draw people's attention to, and it's been mentioned several times, um, the whole notion of our, our cities. More and more and more people live in cities. Uh, I think the report, report points that out. They're older, as one of our, 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 our esteemed authors pointed out as well, too. Um, they're high, very, very knowledgeable, uh, notwithstanding uh, their age. Um, that said, cities are going to play a massive role in shaping what our future looks like, what our energy needs will be, what our transportation and mobility systems look like, and people are at the center of all of those issues I kind of just described at the end. And I think um, our challenge in this geo and future geos and in the global geo is to ensure that we take a people-centric approach to that because the policies are affected by, really affect people. And that's where change is going to take place. And I think if we keep that in mind, um, we'll have uh, a dynamic geo process and we'll continue to have relevant information for decision making.
Thanks so much, Paula. And now I'll turn to the person who probably knows more about GEO than anyone in the room, having been on GEO processes since GEO 4, John Matuszak, who's coordinating the North America report, but also North America's input to the whole process. John, I'm sure you have a lot to say as we move toward the end of the panel. Thank you very much, Melinda. Um, thank you very much, Melinda. Uh, and thanks to the UN Foundation uh, for the great contribution you made in making this happen and your, your contribution in uh, taking time and spending it as a member of uh, the high-level group um, advising and, and really engaging, um, providing a civil society perspective. Thank you also to the Wilson Center for, for this, this effort and to all the authors. Um, as Melinda said, I've been involved in the GEO really since about 2003, 2004, and I think that the GEO has really evolved in an extremely positive way. Jason talked about some of the different steps that have been taken here the advent of, of a high-level advisory panel uh, or, or a high-level group on policy uh, that would advise it, um, the greater reliance on data uh, and the effort, the engagement of civil society, the negotiation of a, of a, of a um, um, uh, summary for policymakers, all have been highlighted. I think that they're really critical, and I think that uh, we have made a major step with the GO6 in adding then regional assessments which serve foundationally for the global assessment uh, and going forward with that. I also, also think that the ongoing engagement that we have with civil society and with the governments around the world are really critical. When GEO started back in 95, governments weren't making data available. There, there was not really a, a, a willingness to share and to talk about a lot of issues at a national level. Things were always talked about on a global level because countries were afraid that somebody might point the finger at them and say, well, there's a problem here. Well, the reality is is that the data is being collected now and information is out there. Even when it's more sparse in developing countries on an issue like air quality or water quality in terms of the the immense amount of data, um, there is a lot more information. And, and frankly, uh, civil society and governments can go beyond their own capacity to collect information to use uh, many of the global uh, data sources that are being compiled and, and the information source. So I think that we are making real progress, and that will make our effort more efficient uh, and effective. Uh, as we look at, and I love Michael's, uh, Michael's characterization of it, that our actions will change the future. As we, we call this a global environmental outlook, what we do uh, will change that. So we can, we can project trends, we can uh, identify outlooks, but the impact of our choices, the choices of our governments and governments around the world and those influenced very much by civil society, really driven by civil society, are really critical. So I want to talk a little bit now about the uses of this geo, of this report that we have electronically up there. I, it would be good if we could actually put the website where, uh, where that can be accessed as well as where all of the other regional reports can be accessed. Uh, and then uh, real briefly about the relationship to some of the SDGs. But I, I think that where is the, is the value of this? Obviously, it is important for decision makers and managers, and it's important for um, you know government officials really at, at all levels to to look at what's happened. And I think, but it will probably have as much impact around the world, the North American report, as it will have here in North America. Uh, I hope that it is uh, taken up by, by governments, but I think that governments um, and um, uh, civil servants and public servants uh, in, the pro um, in foundations and, and beyond government 
um, as well as academics in this country and around the world, um, we, we'll really look at, well, this is what they tell us to do, maybe if we serve as a donor or, or um, serve as a leader in an international uh, negotiation, but what are they doing actually in North America? Uh, and so I think that we will be, this report will be looked at uh, by uh, senior officials and by academics in many, many different parts of the world to see, well, what is it that a country, and they'll look at the European one as well, but, you know, what, I what is it that they're doing there? And have they, even with all of their resources, have they solved all their problems? Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the, 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 the evolution of geo, to some extent, follows a little bit um, an, an approach that we have in the United States, and it's really highlighted in geo, is that we don't just measure um, output, we measure outcomes, or we try to at least. And that's one of the things that's really wonderful about this geo is that we can look at air quality and we can say, okay, or we can look at water quality or we could look at, at, at the forestry issues. And we are not just saying, okay, when we look at a global goal, say this is what we did here, this is the policy we put in place but we can look at the state and trends, the status and trends, and say, does it actually have the desired outcome? Is it actually saving biodiversity? Is air quality getting better? Is water quality getting better? And so we, are, we, we manage, and we do this actually even in the way that we govern. It, not exclusively, but for the most part when we talk about air air regulations, we manage the outcome. We don't insist on the particular technology. We say that you have to meet this standard. Now, to understand whether or not you're meeting that standard, you have to be able to collect the data and to report on it and, and, and look there. But in fact, that allows for innovation. It does not presume uh, how you can actually get there. It allows for adaptive management, for the incorporation of new data sources. So we have done that, and we've actually found, and that's why this is a report that is a very hopeful one, is that we have made some real progress. But across the board, as Mark pointed out, we have real challenges as we see the, the, um, th that that uh, we have new systemic challenges. We also have new systemic solutions which can help us contribute to those challenges. That is not to say that what we have done is not necessary, but it may not be sufficient. And we may need to look to multiple sectors to be able to challenge the, or to address the particular challenge of management of, a, of, a, of an environmental parameter. So, for instance, in looking at water quality and, and at hypoxia zones, we have to look at, you know, the impacts of transportation and nitrogen deposition from, from, from vehicles. We have to look at soil loss in agriculture. We have to look at land transformation and land management, those kinds of issues. Uh, really broadly there. In, in looking at biodiversity, we have to look across the the board and, and uh, we may need to go beyond simply endangered species and in fact we find that our government agencies aren't just looking at the species, they're looking at the habitat, they're looking at the broad kinds of issues that can affect it, they're looking at the, the trying to understand what the impacts of climate change will be and understand what the impacts of invasive alien species could be on those kinds of, of uh, in terms of trying to determine solutions and understand it more on an ecosystem basis. So looking at those complex areas. Um, the approach that we have taken in the United States and in which we increasingly I think GEO is going for and, and it will I think become easier to some extent as more data sources are made available and we have greater coverage in terms of quality and quantity of, of data and, and, and as we continue to use fora around the world, and the President has certainly done this in terms of, of, um, 
of emphasizing the importance of data and open data and transparency in all of his efforts on, on the global development, uh, his global development agenda. So, I, I, the, but, but there are real opportunities. I, there are many students out there, many faculty members, many academics that are out here. Is how do we actually look at connecting? And this is something that GEO tries very hard to do, but it's not always as well studied and documented as we would like. Can we actually link policies and programs to environmental change, changes in the state and trends of the environmental parameters? Initially, you have to look at correlation, but then can we actually get to causality? And there's not going to be an independent straight line one to the other. As Mark pointed out and as others have pointed out, these are very systemic challenges and they will require systemic solutions. But we have to see, you know, have the solutions that we have come up with, either in program or policy, are they actually moving things in the right direction? Do they continue to be necessary? Are they sufficient? Do they have unintended consequences? So out there in terms of the, the many students and faculty members that are actually looking at that, trying to actually document that and put that together, we've done it to some extent and we can in the United States and in Canada because we have a really rich source of data and it's better documented here than in most of the world but it is truly necessary to give the to to help to foster the political will to take hard choices and make hard decisions if policymakers are going to do that we have to sh to give them some assurance that there is hope of success and that the resources that they expend as we continue now in a development policy to insist that it not just be donor driven but that it be owned by the governments mm -hmm. and the communities mm -hmm. that are living in those conditions that they make investments of their time and resources into the solutions that we can actually have some evidence base that the solutions that we're encouraging them to try have been tried elsewhere and that they will certainly adapt them to their local conditions, but that there is hope that they, in fact, can be effective and can result in the kinds of outcomes in terms of improving the quality of the environment and the quality of the life of their people that, in fact, will be successful. So in terms of the uses of the North American um, GEO-6 regional assessment, I think it will serve as a great foundation for the, the, the global, but it will also serve as an example around the world in terms of the importance of collecting data to be able to determine whether or not uh, these policies are useful, and it will be an example to other parts of the world in terms of that we are in fact trying to, we are struggling, we have made progress, it is uh, we have made ex, uh, you know, that we have taken steps that are necessary in some cases, but not sufficient. In some cases, we have made mistakes, and th there needs to be additional efforts out there. And I think that this document documents, or, or this document provides a lot of the evidentiary basis of those things. So those are the kinds of uses I think it'll be useful here and around the world. The links to the SDGs, I can only say I'm, I don't want to take up too much more time. Uh, well over half of the SDGs have a major environmental component. And I think that they, they really emphasize as we go to the targets, you know, the importance of looking at things in an integrated way. When you look at goal two on sustainable food production systems, you know, looking at the impacts of climate and weather and water and soil and soil and the, the impacts of food production in terms of pollution of water and air and the energy use that it has and chemical pollutants, which affect other goals that are out there, such as health goals for healthy lives, 
uh, where they talk about hazards from chemical from uh, chemicals and air pollution and water pollution and soil pollution. All of these things need to be looked at in a in a very integrated way. But we see for goal, you know, goals two, goals three, goals, goals six on water quality, efficiency, governance, IWRM, and ecosystems. There, are, these are addressed to some extent in this issue, in this document. It says in some places where we are falling short, groundwater governance is not something that we have mm -hmm. really, and it's become a major issue out in California, but really in much of the arid West. You know, we, we have different, sometimes very complex governance structures for surface water, and they're different for the east par eastern United States and the western United States. But regarding groundwater withdrawals um, and, and, uh, and use, there's virtually no governance out there, and it can differ between counties. Uh, and we've mm -hmm. seen this in Arizona, where from between different counties, uh, somebody will go just outside the county line, and they can sink a um, a uh, well in with for for uh, to put in a new farm mm -hmm. in the desert and suck up all the water that maybe otherwise had been um, planned mm -hmm. for an urban community or an existing city. Those are the points that I wanted to make. I'm happy to take some questions. I've I've got a lot to say, but uh, we've got limited time. So I want to thank you all for this, and please use this resource. I think it's excellent for classes, and I think that it will be used very broadly, and I want to congratulate the authors on mm -hmm. a really tremendous job. Thank you very much. So um, I'd like to move to some questions after an exceptionally rich discussion. So. We'll start back here, and I think we've got groups. Yes, sir. A question for either Paula or Terry. One of Terry's maps showed uh, sulfide problem areas, and a growing hot spot seemed to be in uh, Labrador. And could you explain that? And I just um, uh, can you hear me? Is this mic working? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, just uh, we started uh, with a good point about complexity and interdependence, um, and mm -hmm. just uh, I think Paula covered a lot of issues that many people didn't. So I'd like to just ask a question about data. Like I'll in the beginning, we were focusing on the U.S. and North America, and then mm -hmm. just psychologically, it seemed a lot of indicators looked good. And I was wondering if people could say how the calculations for the data are done. Because it seems a lot of the pollution and environmental effects of consumption here and production are actually outsourced to Asia. So they're linked to American and North American consumption and not regionally the way we look at nation states, as people mm. pointed out, right? So if you just look at all of your laptops and paper that you're using and pens and even the clothes we're wearing here, they're probably all made in Asia. So the chemicals related to that will be put out there and measured there. So it just seems a little deceptive. And what would you do with your methodology to correct mm -hmm. that if that was not done? And could the answers be very specific, please, and not like we should be or something like that? Thank you very much. That's great. OK, so I'm going to try to get four questions and then go back through the panel. And I'll take that young woman in the back after this gentleman here. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Barber from the Integrative Strategies Forum. And um, there was a lot of mention about the importance of cities, the growing importance of cities. And I've been at a number of uh, workshops with uh, sustainability directors from a lot of the major cities in the U.S. and Canada. And one of the, th the, co the themes that c kept coming up was the difficulty in communicating um, a l the importance of a lot of these issues, the complex dealing with the complexity of it, and also with the resistance and maybe the denial and fear of of a lot of these environmental issues we know that in in a lot of public opinion research and, and the environment tends to be very low in, in terms of uh, the what's seen as importance by people so i'm wondering if in in this discussion what what well what kind of discussion among the authors has there been about the about ways innovations ways to reframe or to communicate 
the importance of a lot of these issues and the and the availability of the information in ways that uh, that that work for the people in cities and the general public. Great, and the last one. Yes. Hi, my name is Rosanna Marie Neal, and I'm the director of the Sustainable World Initiative. Um, I have a question for Terry Keating. You showed evidence that um, emissions of certain air pollutants have decreased in the U.S. while the economy continued to expand. And so my question is, in your view, does that demonstrate that the health of the entire Earth system can improve while the global economy expands? <laughs> well, that's really challenging. So <laughs> I'm going to start with... Terry, Sumi, Paula, and John. So we'll, some of these will catch different issues. So, Terry. Okay. Um, so um, first, the issue about um, sulfate deposition in Labrador. I'm not sure that I, I see the data the same way. There, there's actually a decrease in in, in Labrador. For so maybe we can do look at that offline together and and talk about that. Um, the second thing, I, I want to address the issue of uh, the environmental impacts of consumption of production uh, from, from other countries. And I, I think this is a really um, interesting and, and important uh, way of looking at the world. Um, in another, uh, another role I have is I, I actually co-chair a group um, called the Task Force on Hemispheric Transport of Air Pollution, which is specifically looking at how air pollution flows from one part of the world to another part of the world. Um, and, and one of the important pieces of that that we actually don't look at in the analysis right now is, yes, but so you have emissions uh, in, in one part of the world, but it's due to the production of products that are actually consumed in, in other parts of the world. There's very little analysis has actually been done for that. Um, one of the first analyses that I, and the only work that I know of that's been done for that has been done with respect to China. And, and the first analysis was done um, by David Streets um, at Argonne National Lab and, and some of his Chinese um, counterparts. And, and uh, um, there's since been a, a number of Chinese scientists who uh, have developed uh, emissions inventories for China that look at how much of the emissions are associated with production for export and also how much of the emissions in one part of China are due to consumption in other parts of China. And, and it's a very interesting way of looking at things. And I'm, I'm very, it, it's, it's something that we d haven't had the data to, to do that. And it's something that I think is gaining more recognition. And But you need to get to some underlying data, and there's a lot of work that, that needs to go in there. But I think it's a really interesting question, and I, and I hope that we, we work on that. So um, it's not something that people ha are completely ignorant of. Um, but I don't think it's an easy thing to do. Um, the, the issue of, um, of whether I, I think that emissions that, that that because we've been able to um, continue to increase the economy in the in the U.S. and and continue to to control emissions, um, I'm not I'm not sure I have the I, I don't think that 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 makes that case. So I, I think those are two different questions, and that um, and I, I'm not sure I have the ability right now to 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 speak about the long term sustainability of the Earth and and consumption patterns. I I think. Um, what we do know, uh, I, 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 I think, is that if if consumption, if everybody in the world consumed the way we do in the United States, I think the world would have a very big problem. Um, and so we don't want that to happen. Um, but what we have learned is that is that it's not that that there are ways of managing uh, environmental problems that that do, it doesn't mean the end of the industry. It doesn't mean the end of, of some economic activity. Um, there are ways that there, there is technology, there, there are policy approaches that can be applied. And, um, and time and time again, when someone comes in and says, you have to clean up, they say, well, that's gonna cost the, the economy. And actually what we're seeing, and what we've proven in the United States is that 
you, you can, where you have data, you can quantify the impacts. Um, there was a recent study just in, um, done in China using a lot of the things that we've developed here, looking at the cost of air pollution to the, the labor market in, in China. And the cost of air pollution in China to lost labor is uh, measurable in percentages of the GDP. I mean, it's big. And, and so you, the, the, the idea of, of economic, uh, that, that environmental protection does not mean the end of economic um, development and, and, and prosperity. So me. Uh, maybe just to really quickly build on to what Terry was saying, because I've seen this both um, on, on, on the transport side of things and then also on the household air pollution side of things, where, as Terry mentioned, it's one thing to think about where things are being produced um, and the impacts there, but we also have, I think, now increasing situations where there may be products that don't actually meet our standards here, um, and then they actually appear somewhere else. Um, and, and it's certainly then making a big contribution to problems. Um, interesting, I mean, I think for automobiles, people are more familiar. We've actually seen some cases of, um, you know, for, for some of the um, cleaner cook stoves where um, the, they, they're actually shipping to Africa in a box because they're used here, saying, please do not, this is not regulated for use indoors. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is, of course, a problem right, yeah. when people are being mm -hmm. using, it, using it for household settings. Mm -hmm. Paula. Paula. Thank you, Melinda, and uh, excellent question. Um, I think I'll, I'll probably tackle a, only two of them and, and briefly. Uh, with respect to the outsourcing of pollution, I think that has been a, um, a long understood issue. Um, but as um, Terry pointed out, I think that the, the, the science and the, the data around it needs to be a good example of the geo context. Again, needs to be in place so that so that decisions can be made. I would draw attention to two two initiatives: um, uh, the uh, ecosystem. Looking at it here, the ecosystem and economic the ecosystem, the economics of ecosystem and biodiversity. Mm -hmm. This key project mm -hmm. ran by. Um, have a system, uh, system, um, mm -hmm. that has now resulted in the natural capital protocol mm -hmm. um, where people will start to cost the natural capital usage of their mm -hmm. product and those sorts of things are things you're starting to see now and I believe that was just released mm -hmm. in the last few weeks um, that it's taken them years of that work um, to, to come up with a protocol to actually now be in a place where you, people could actually make use of it so scaling that up to the national statistical level is, is, is an even bigger, bigger challenge. There is um, some work underway at the uh, OECD as well on trade flows. And so until those trade flows are completely understood um, and completely quantified and completely equilibrated, <laughs> uh, technical word there, Paula, um, again, it's hard to apply that uh, net accounting that we're talking about. But those are all things people are working on. So while Geosix may not have that embedded into its indicators right now, um, I think that there is uh, an, an acknowledgement in Geosix about national capital accounting mm -hmm. um, and national accounting systems um, are the way for those things to happen in the future. And to the extent to which those social carbon and those kinds of principles get embedded into our accounting procedures, either at the national level or in other means, until those happen with the proper science and the proper data balancing exercises underway, um, I'm not sure we can report on them per se, but I would give you some assurance that there's massive international undertaking on those, on at least those two examples I present that, that are saying that there's some, there's some really important effort going under, going on so that we can do that in the future. And that's foundational, fundamental um, science work that just needs to be done and data, data methodological work mm -hmm. to sort out. The other, the other um, question that was raised about effectively was around mm -hmm. communication. Um, and if you read the Geosix report, you'll, you'll, you'll very quickly understand and see that it is a very technical document. Um, all efforts were made to make sure that it, it, it it can speak to a wide group of audiences, but I think what it highlights for all of us who've been in the environmental sciences and environmental indicators and environmental reports business is that that is our number one challenge. 
Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's number one, but it is hugely important. And so how do we communicate in a way that retains the integrity of the information? And that's a challenge. And so, but there are simple things that we can do. So while we might talk about um, uh, in a city context, we're going to talk about GHG emissions from transportation. Mm, doesn't mean anything, but if you start to talk to me about mobility and how I get around, now I'm going to listen. If you start to talk to me about things that impact me and from my context, again, from a people-centric point of view, you, we're probably going to do a better job. So not only do we have the science policy interface that we've been talking about implicitly in, in most of the afternoon, we also have the science public interface. Mm-hmm. And the ability to communicate science in a really simple way that doesn't discredit or uh, undervalue the integrity of the science, but actually makes it accessible to people will be a huge, you know, huge uh, in how we move these agenda forward. So I'm not going to speak exactly to how indicators are calculated and, and any of those things, but I think those are two things that we're very cognizant of and how we try to tackle those in the future is, is, is going to be a huge, a huge challenge. And, you know, the children, the youth of our future are, are really fundamental to that, how they communicate, the kind of language they use to communicate, the mediums they use to communicate is how that's going to happen in the future. Uh, I firmly believe that as a parent of a teenager. Uh, I, I, I mm-hmm. truly think that we need to start to speak inside the language and inside mm-hmm. the, the tools that those people are, are using. So again, with that, I, I don't know that I have completely all the questions and the Labrador thing, I'm not sure about, again, that's an offline conversation in, okay. in detail, but okay. um, Melinda, thank you for the opportunity to reply. Thanks, Paula. John, I might let you kind of wrap up on the question. Yeah, just two questions, or two points. One on, on, and I'll address the same ones that Paula did because the others were more technical uh, air pollution issues. But um, on the on the um, uh, awareness raising in cities and that, well, polls don't show necessarily these as being the, the greatest issues. I would point to some real trends, and this is one of the reasons why we were really glad that the private sector was a part of this. I mean, I like to quote a, a um, um, you know, a figure, what is it, Unilever has a billion transactions a day or interactions with co- uh, consumers a day. And so their their effort, but, but look at the impacts, and these are, are addressed to some extent in the North American uh, issue of things like, you know, bike sharing and ride sharing processes and programs and, and what those have done for transportation about innovations like battery technology. Look at just the demand uh, for the new Tesla, you know, electric vehicle and uh, the tremendous demand for hybrid vehicles in this country and how quickly that that changed when people, you know, voted in terms of their consumer choice and how people use when they have information on energy efficient appliances and that. So I think that while they may not rise um, in terms of a presidential poll or something like that, or even in a mayor, that in fact those kinds of issues, bike lanes, transportation, public transportation, and its effectiveness in this city certainly are, are important. To go back to the issue of, of um, the outsourcing, again, I don't think we're sophisticated enough to necessarily get that, but I would highlight, as did Paula and others, the idea of natural capital accounting, and I think that those are critical in here. Uh, One of the things certainly related to trade uh, and issues, I know that uh, with the free trade agreements that do exist, there is a real effort to try and ensure that countries that have taken on global commitments on the environment, uh, that they actually meet those commitments and their support for, for developing countries in terms of trying to make sure that um, those that, that where we are linked to the United States, at least in, in free trade agreements, that those countries are in fact honoring the commitments that they've made to global processes. And that is in fact what the multilateral environmental agreements are about, is to try and raise those standards uh, so that we in fact you know, do have common standards on the environment and, and that you don't have uh, any greater impact of 
environmental degradation from economic activities uh, in developing countries that you do in developed countries. Um, but the natural capital accounting is a real step in the right direction. We have it really at a national level agreed by the, um, the UN Statistical Commission. Um, they're trying to move into you know, the broad impacts on ecosystems. The reference that, that Paula just made in terms of the natural capital protocol is actually where the private sector is trying to actually incorporate and understand how they can do natural capital accounting and agree on some common standards and definitions and units of measurement. Those are always the issues when you come to it, and I'm sure Terry encounters this every day when he, uh, he engages with that panel, is how do you actually come up with common definitions, units of measurement, and, and trying to get a fair system and, and an agreed system that uh, all the governments uh, of the world or all the, the major economic players are going to, in fact, uh, be able to agree on. So there are some, some challenges, certainly, in progressing that, but we have certainly taken some very positive steps over the past few years, and some of that is highlighted in this agreement. And I'm happy to say that natural capital accounting was identified in many of the other regions as really an important uh, issue that needed to be progressed. Thank you. So I think this has been an incredibly rich panel. And I'd like, first of all, to thank the panelists, and particularly Paula, who joined us by technology. And I'd like to say I think we've come to three particular conclusions on this panel. Data and its accessibility have been transformative to the GEO process this time. Technology and how we choose to use it can help us select and traverse pathways that will lead to better outcomes. And finally, we need to go beyond governments and involve the private sector and the public in charting our course. I'd like to ask both Jason and Roger Mark to come up and make a few closing comments very quickly. And I'd like to thank you all for coming. Thank you. Jason. Thanks very much, Melinda. And uh, I'll, be, I'll be quite brief here. Uh, mine is just to say thanks. Uh, uh, a confession when John approached me uh, a few weeks ago about, about having this session. Uh, uh, today on the 21st, I was a little bit reticent. Confession that uh, that with with uh, the time that we had to put it together, but I am glad that his voice carried the day, and more to the point, I am I am uh, indebted to uh, to the Wilson Center and Roger Mark and Melinda Kimball and the UN and the UN Foundation and and John uh, all of your efforts uh, in helping to bring this together. Um, and I'm going to take occasion, because I, sh I seldomly get occasion, to thank uh, the, the machinery of people who are involved in, uh, in this particular assessment. Um, there are a handful of you in the room, potentially more watching, uh, but to, to everyone, really, who was involved in GeoProcess, and there, there's, there's tens of, of authors and uh, experts who have devoted their, their own time pro bono uh, it's a it's a gracious community of intelligent people who routinely go above and beyond and who uh, you know are underpaid in this effort, um, but who make it who make it uh, uh, come to life and who make it worth it. So, <coughs> for what it's worth, everyone in the room, uh, thank you very much. And and again, my thanks to those who were able to engage and participate uh, in the panels and uh, in the seats. So thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Wow, an, a, another um, engaging session. I think as we um, reflect on the book and the content and how we get beyond the book, which is I think how we started this afternoon's discussion. Just to build on the final themes that we had uh, from Melinda, I think once again we talked about questions of scale 
you know, we talked about this importance um, as a regional report, but once again, we reflected that local decisions and local tools are really um, where there's a, a strategic opportunity to make a difference. I think there was also a connection to the global challenges and how we bring this down also at an individual level. Um, we talked about cities and households and indigenous peoples. So scale, for me, really came out in our discussion today. There was also um, a, a lot of discussion on complexity, integrations, systemic connections, governance, policies, social support, policy uncertainties, and information. Um, so we talked about that in the context across forests, lands, air, forecasting, household emissions, energy, um, and planning. So a lot of dimensions there that I think we captured. And then, as, as Jason had alluded to in the very beginning, um, with the report to think about emerging issues for us, I think one thing that really came out was having to adapt to emerging trends. We kept hearing from the authors that we had finished the report, but things were kept coming back. We had to go back, and, and there's always a push. How do we keep pace with this emerging situation, and, and, and how do we deal with that in a way that's transparent, that allows us to capitalize on the innovation, that makes us um, find opportunities to engage those most affected? How do we leverage environmental multilateralism? and what it means for providing leadership. There was very much a conversation about our responsibility in North America to really test these solutions if we are going to engage on a global scale. So that, I think, is a very important consideration for us to look at. A lot of conversation on technology and what it means in terms of uh, how environmental management is about influencing the path of technologies and then really important data, integrated open source data platforms, active in real time environmental access assessment, credibility, how do we fill the data gaps and continue to improve on data. So amazing discussion, uh, just just amazing and, and really critical at this point in time. So once again, this has been recorded. It was webcast live. It is video archived now on our website at newsecuritybeat.org. All of the presentations are there, so you can go back and refer to them. And we will be writing up a blog summary of the discussions that we have had this afternoon. So as we think about how we get beyond the book and create solutions to the transformative world that we, we are creating, no that this discussion lives on and that entails in continuing to engage with you. So once again, thank you to UNEP, thank you to the UN Foundation, to our panelists, to the authors for this really important piece of work. And once again, go back to www.unep.org geo for um, your copy of the report. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it worked okay. Yeah. It's amazing. Real challenge. Part of the whole afternoon was it, it worked okay. Right.